Uh, good afternoon, good uh, noon. Um, very happy today to uh, introduce um, the speaker and the commentator, so um, Quinn Grundy and Adrian Schneer, um, for a seminar on uh, conflict of interest in the nursing profession. Uh, Quinn is an assistant professor with the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. I think she joined this this year. Yeah, month. <laughs> uh, and an honorary senior lecturer with the School of Pharmacy and the Charles Perkins Center at the University of Sydney. Dr. Grindley's research explores the commercial determinants of health and their impact on the delivery of health services, health evidence, and consumer health information. She has a bachelor's in science in nursing from Alberta, a PhD in nursing from the University of California, San Francisco, uh, where she worked uh, under supervision of uh, Dr. Ruth Malone on um, the tobacco uh, control, uh, tobacco industry influence on, on research as well. Dr. Grundy is a member of the International Evidence Policy and Influence Collaborative at the University of Sydney, who recently came in the news again about a new study on uh, conflict of interest. So they are a very, very prolific research group. She's the author of uh, Infiltrating Healthcare, How Marketing Works Underground to Influence Nurses, which is um, the topic that she will be speaking about today. It's a book that also came out uh, last year with uh, Johns Hopkins University Press. So it's um, the first in-depth study of the ways that registered nurses interact with the pharmaceutical and medical device industry. Um, and she's also the author of numerous articles uh, in leading medical bioethics and health policy journals. After uh, Quinn's presentation, we'll have Dr. Adrian Schneer, uh, who is an adjunct professor in the Health Policy and Management and Global Health Program at the Faculty of Health of uh, York University. Um, she has an MA and a PhD in Health Policy and Equity with a specialization in pharmaceutical policy regulation, education, and financial conflict of interest from the School of Health Policy and Management. Adrian is also um, expecting her law degree in June 2019 from the other good law school uh, up north uh, here, Osgoode Hall Law School. She's a research fellow alumna of the Pharmaceutical Policy Research Collaboration and in general her work focuses on uh, pharmaceutical policy regulation, education and promotion, health policy, governance, financial conflict of interest relationships and so on. So she, she's also the author of numerous articles um, in health policy, uh, law journals, chapters and books um, and has presented widely on the topics. So I've worked with uh, Adrian in, in the past, I'm very happy that she uh, actually added a lot of degree to her already strong specialization in, um, on the issues of pharmaceutical policy. So um, Quinn will speak for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. As usual, I have a list of questions from the students that I will start with first. And I will also uh, distribute a, um, a present list, particularly for the students, but also for the others, so that we have a sense of who is present in, at the seminar. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am, as Trudeau said, I'm, I'm new to Toronto and to the U of T, so I think this is today I've, I've survived my first month, so great to be here. Maybe you guys could just give me a quick sense of who I'm talking to here. So how many of you are law students? Okay, great. Any, any health professionals? Any nurses? No. I'm going to talk behind their backs. But <laughs> Great. Um, can I grab you? Do you have the other? There's a couple other pages. Oh. Just in case. Are they in there? Ah, perfect. Thanks. I may not need them, but just in, just in case. Um, so I shared a paper with you today, and I'm going to touch on aspects of it, but I've also tried in this talk to pull out what I think is especially relevant from a, a legal and then particularly a policy perspective and unpacking how we might start thinking about industry interactions in clinical settings from that perspective. Um, so I'll go through some things, but please feel free to also interrupt or if you have questions along the way or, or comments, I'm happy to take some tangents. 
So I just first wanted to acknowledge this project was funded by the CIHR and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in the States, and then it was work done at University of California, San Francisco. So I'm sharing data that does come from a United States perspective, uh, and it'd be interesting to talk about how it might be relevant in Canada as well. I think globally we're seeing some really interesting legal developments in this space through the emergence of what are broadly referred to as sunshine laws or regulation. And they, they derive this nickname from the sense that transparency lets the light shine in and has a cleansing effect on what might be untoward uh, relationships between generally health professionals and for-profit medically related industry, which is typically pharmaceutical and medical device companies. So I think the United States um, is perhaps the best known. Part of the Affordable Care Act had a little section carved out called the United States Physician Payments Sunshine Act. And back in 2012, I think it became active. And all pharmaceutical or device companies whose products are covered by Medicare were required to publicly disclose any payment to a physician that was valued at $10 or more. And if you go to the website of the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, there is a database called Open Payments. You can look up a doctor by name or practice address and you'll see every payment they've received, the reason for the payment, the company, and the date, I think. So for example, if your GP attended a drug company sponsored dinner, the value of that meal would be reported in this database and you would see which company had sponsored that meal. There'd be bigger payments for things uh, like consulting agreements, sitting on an advisory board, or even payments for research. And at the time I was, I was just in the early stages of this project when this law came out, and I was really surprised that it didn't apply to nurses. And as a nurse myself, I, I, I had been to a drug company sponsored dinner. I knew of colleagues that received payments for speaking at industry events or had been paid to go to conferences. So I think the first question for me was, did policymakers think that these same kind of interactions were not happening? Or did they somehow think they weren't that important? And in, in the meantime, a number of other countries, I think, are contemplating or have some form of, um, a number of countries in Europe have similar legislation, France most notably. Um, and this is some work Adrian and I did together. We looked at the states, France and Australia, which has a, an industry self-regulation model for this Sunshine Act regulation. Um, and, and nurses and other health professionals are included in some of the other jurisdictions. So some of the data that I'll, I'll share today actually draws from analyzing payment reports in other places. So far in Canada, I think there was some talk of bringing in something similar, but seems to be stalled out at the moment. What do we know about marketing to nurses? There's not a great deal of research on this topic. I think broadly we can generalize that when nurses have prescribing authority, so talking about nurse practitioners, we see really similar patterns with physicians. So sales reps dropping by their office for a practice we call detailing, um, lunches, dinners, consulting, speakers, fees, research payments. Though I would have to say in general, nurses get. Their payments are for a lot less money. Uh, we know that in, in Australia, when we analyze their transparency reports, though, Australia had a unique database where companies reported every event that they sponsored for health professionals. So everything from journal clubs to seminar series to conferences. And we found out that there was at least one nurse in attendance at over 40% of these events. So the impression that we're getting is that marketing tends to be very inclusive, but law and policy is really focused on health professionals who can prescribe. 
and that this seems to be the, the policy priority for controlling or trying to deal with undue influence. But I think uh, if, if you read in the article I shared, I think what's also starting to come out is that nurses have a huge degree of influence over not only treatment decisions, but also purchasing. And this is something that sunshine laws and a lot of conflict of interest policy aren't really touching on at all. And in contrast to the scrutiny of the pharmaceutical industry, in my view, the device industry and influence over clinical purchasing decisions is really flying under the radar. So I designed a study. I did an ethnographic study. I looked at four different hospitals in the states. And in some ways, the states is a great place to kind of do some comparative research because they have every type of funding model of a hospital you can think of. So the public institution is probably, or I would say, mm, it's all a bit blurry. Some of these are private, not-for-profits, publicly funded. I had one for-profit hospital. And in the end, I'd have to say I didn't notice stark differences among them. So these kinds of interactions were happening across the board. And I did interviews and observations and shadowed people in a variety of nursing roles, but also spoke to sales reps, people working in the supply chain, and administrators. And I think what came out of this research and through the rest of this talk, I'll kind of draw on these, what I call these pervasive assumptions. And particularly this was coming from hospital administrators, but kind of trickled through the entire sample. And the first was this sense that nurses didn't really interact with industry. And I'll explore this in a little while. And particularly because they didn't prescribe, they would have no reason to. And then following from that, if I could see an instance where a nurse and a sales rep had an interaction, people told me, well, that, that's not marketing. And they would say it was for education or support, or it had another name. So they, they didn't think of these interactions as marketing. And then finally, when nurses did engage in what was blatant marketing, so for example, attending a drug company-sponsored dinner, Nurses had this sort of response of, well, I sort of wonder why they invited us. We kind of thought of it as a fun night out. And this really surprised me because they could share stories where they had a great deal of influence over treatment decisions, purchasing decisions, but they weren't making the link into why industry would be interested in marketing to them. So I'll, I'll revisit these assumptions as we go through this, this talk. and and. What I'm hoping to give you an impression of is what I'm calling the as-if world of nursing. And in the article I, I gave you, I think this, the as-if world of nursing manifests in a number of ways, but in this context, there are structures and policies and, and ways of practicing that make it appear as if nurses don't interact with industry and as if these interactions are not influential. And so for nurses themselves, it makes these interactions feel ethically quite benign. They, they can be comfortable attending a drug-sponsored dinner because it's not going to affect them anyway. But it also becomes invisible at the policy level. So the public doesn't have the opportunity to scrutinize these relationships and the effects they might have. This was really typical. When I started this study, I was trying to get access to hospitals. And I had a, an acquaintance that introduced me to another acquaintance. And, and I spoke to this woman who was a nurse. And she was in charge of what we in healthcare call the cath lab. So this is, um, I think the formal name would be the cardiac catheterization lab. So a lot of procedures now that are done on a heart for example, let's say you have a blockage. You don't have to go for open heart surgery anymore, but you can go and get a catheter thread through a leg vein, worked up into your heart, and they can place things like stents or balloons. Uh, so they tend to be very high-tech procedures with a lot of really expensive implants. And so she really wanted me to come and do my study in her department because she was explaining that the nurses had interactions with sales reps from these device companies on a daily basis. 
and that in fact the sales reps for these stents and balloons and wires and catheters were present during these cases for the entire time that a patient would be there and also beforehand to set up and afterwards to clean up which blew my mind a little bit even as a nurse I wasn't quite aware of this so we were trying to get formal permission for me to come in to observe this but we got this response from the vice president of nursing at the hospital. And she said, I don't think our hospital is a venue for this study. Our nurses and managers do not interact with vendors. If a vendor, and this is the name they use for sales reps, is asked to present, it's done in a structured committee. The only interaction our nurses and managers would have is with the in-service arm of a company we've purchased a new product from. Thus, my answer is no. So, I thought that was interesting because on the one hand she was saying they don't have any interactions, but then she was listing all the places where they did have interactions. So I was a little bit mystified but also really interested by that response. And this happened a few times as I was casting around trying to get into hospitals where they say, no, it doesn't happen here. It only happens on all these committees. It only happens in in-services. It only happens for our education. I was like, well, that seems like a lot of interaction. And people kept pointing, they say, oh, you know, our hospital has a policy. You should maybe go to a hospital that doesn't have a policy. And I was like, well, if they're still there, I'm, I'm interested in your policy. So it took me, it took me a few goes. But I think this, this started to feed into some of those assumptions. So if there was a policy in place, these interactions certainly were no longer considered marketing, even if that person also wore a sales hat. So for example, these reps that are in the, the cath lab, they're there certainly to provide technical support. Many of them also work on commission, which to me was a bit problematic. And then as I went along, I also started talking to front lines, nurses, people in, in clinical roles, and what they told me was pretty much the opposite of what the administration had said. They said, we interact very heavily and we've done so for decades. And I think, what is interesting is that in contrast to what we see in the news or hear about with Sunshine Acts, with the speaking and the consulting and the drug dinners, nurses talked a lot more about the sales rep they met on the job. And these were interactions that happened on the day-to-day -day in operating rooms, cath labs, product in-services, um, nurses sit on purchasing committees for hospitals. You think of all the stuff that a hospital uses. Usually the big ticket items, physicians have a lot of say in that, but anything from gloves to pumps to scanners to needles to wound care, nurses are, are increasingly involved in those decisions. And so they started telling me these stories. And I think the other story they were telling me is that things that were really important to them, so their own continuing education, teaching patients about their health condition and their meds, supporting patients and families. These were things that had been in cut year after year. Budget maybe used to be there, no more. And so industry reps were stepping up to provide resources and support to also engage in these sorts of things. And so that idea that these interactions weren't marketing just became stronger and stronger because nurses says, well, they're helping us with education. They're bringing product support. Um, and and it, it was getting muddier and muddier. But I also want to say that a lot of this is not new. So what we know about the relationships between pharma and the device manufacturers and physicians is that it's a lot about what they call friendship, food, and flattery. And so while a lot of these interactions, yes, had an education component, a support component, a technical component, there was so much food. And there was cookies in the break room, and there was Chinese takeaway, and pizza lunches, and chocolate minis. And unfortunately for the nurses, perhaps, like these were not the steak dinners with wine, though there were those two. Uh, but it, it, nurses could be had quite cheaply in the friendship, food, and flattery department because they don't get a lot of that otherwise. Uh, one nurse manager said, 
it's endless, do you know what I mean? It can be very subtle. Okay, you've got a nice, attractive person. Okay, they seem to have a really nice personality. Okay, you know what? They're taking you out. They're paying for things. The perfect friend. And I think for nurses, because they encountered these sales reps daily, they felt more like a colleague. So they would be in the operating room standing beside the sales rep. They'd see them every week. The sales rep would join the company softball team, would be at the Christmas party. They, they developed friendships over time. And I think it felt quite natural and it felt quite normal, even though it was also quite strategic. And so before I, I kind of delve into what I think is different about the context of nursing, I also want to say that the things that we worry about, drug company sponsored dinner, sponsored travel to international meetings, big speaking payments, that was also happening to nurses. And I think from a legal standpoint, this idea of kickbacks becomes relevant. Um, and I think there's certainly cause for concern among nursing and the purchasing role in particular. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I consider the context for nursing practice. And the way that nurses work can be quite different from the practice of medicine and how industry is kind of fit itself into that model in order to market its products more effectively. So Rachel was a nurse I spoke, spoke to, and she has what I call an undoable job. So she is a clinical nurse specialist in the area of wound care. She worked at a public hospital that had about 400 beds. And she, her job was essentially to consult on every patient with a wound that's admitted to the hospital. So that might not sound like a big deal, but you have to remember that anyone who undergoes surgery for any reason ends up with a wound. And that's on top of the people with diabetes, other circulatory conditions that might have wounds for other reasons, or the people who are in bed or in hospital for a long time and actually develop a wound as a consequence of their stay. Huge scope, a huge amount to specialize on, and a huge number of people. And she was one person. So she's really a one-woman show, and she said, you know, I had to learn to focus on what I need to achieve that day. She also sat on the hospital purchasing committee. So if the hospital was going to buy anything to do with wound care, Rachel was the resident expert that would be tasked with doing the research or even telling the hospital that something new was on the market and helping them evaluate that and then implement that and then teach the 4,000 nurses who work there how to use that new product. This is one person's job. So she interacted with sales representatives from wound care companies all the time. And they would stop by the hospital, they'd bring her bags of samples, they'd be there if she had a question, they'd let her know what was new. She had a drawer in her desk just full of wound care samples, so she had, let's say she had a patient with a really tricky wound, she'd go there, dig some out, and, and try it out. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with with pharmaceutical policy and some of the problems we've had around drug samples, but this causes huge problems for a hospital because products that they're not aware of, that they can't bill for, that they can't be reimbursed for, are now wandering around the hospital. If that patient, if that product works for them, that patient gets transferred, suddenly there's no more wound dressing, but maybe it doesn't work and maybe it's not safe and there's no one to kind of oversee this trialing of new and it's always more expensive stuff. Those drug reps are never dropping off cheaper samples, ever. That's not where free samples come in. So, but she, you know, Rachel found them really helpful. And this wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of food, there wasn't a lot of flattery. They got Rachel and they got that they needed to just be there to help her out. And when she went on vacation for a month, she said, the staff nurses need to have a relationship with this person. They need someone they can call and say, I'm missing this bag. I have no idea how to use this. I have a problem with this equipment. They need to have this relationship as well. And so the nurses that she worked with, she almost passed on her relationships with reps. And they infiltrated the hospital in ways that they could continue to promote their samples and their products. So I went to a big critical care conference in nursing. And one of the, uh, the booths, Hospira is a big medical device. I think they do drugs and drug delivery systems. They do that. They're a huge company. 
And, and actually, before I got to the conference, they sent me this in the mail. And so obviously, like, there's this idea, there's like a helping hand. And they say, let's. Let's work together. Let's envision. Let's take action. And they say, you know, we'll be at, at the booth. We're here to listen. Tell us what you need. And when you think about this kind of marketing to nurses, it's really different in some sense than that flattery in the food. You know, this is, this is saying, we've got your back. We're a team. And we've got resources to help you. But also, we want, we want to hear you. We want to know what you have to need. And nurses find this extremely validating. Because very often, people are not asking nurses for their opinion, even when they should be. And so I think when we think about marketing to nurses, we're seeing initiatives that are much more consistent with the values of nursing practice. And this is very intentional and very strategic, but means we need to think about marketing in, in different ways. So back to this idea of, of policies. So the, the people I talk to often started by saying, well, our hospital has a policy, so we don't have a problem. And they had several formal mechanisms that they really liked to talk about that they, were, that they used to try and control marketing in clinical spaces. So hospitals all had this issue of sales reps just dropping by. And they said they'd come in, they'll troll the units, they try and bend an ear, they try and grab whatever clinician they have, they try and put samples on the units, and they wanted to really cut down on that. So one um, nurse, she, she called reps local species. And, and she encountered them quite often coming onto units to, to do a quick training on something that the hospital had purchased. And they, she said they come in, they interrupt our day, they teach us something, and then they leave. Those ones are an invasive species rather than a local species. Whereas for me, all this time we're working with Epic, and they make an electronic health record, has made it a less uncomfortable relationship. There's collaboration. You have to work together to get to the end point. So the reps that just dropped by or came in and out were invasive. But the reps that were there every day, who were meant to be there, these were the ones that became built into the system. And so there, the, the hospitals all had policies where vendors or sales reps had to register with the hospital, had to wear identification, had to have an appointment, um, they had formal committees they could present to, or they had these structured in-services that they were actually contracted to perform. And this was the way that their interactions became not marketing, but something the hospital endorsed. So one in particular um, was, they call it vendor credentialing. There's actually a whole industry now of third-party providers that will basically screen Sales reps. So sales reps have to go and apply to these systems and show that they're vaccinated, for example, have done criminal records checks, have signed confidentiality agreements, maybe they've done training in um, like how to keep things sterile, for example. Um, and so hospitals required vendors to check in when they came to the hospital and have an appointment and then to wear a badge. In some spaces, they actually made them wear different colored scrubs. So if you were in the cath lab or the operating theater, everyone's in, in greens, but the sales reps would have to wear bright red or like a funny hat or something. Um, and you could see them at like, if you're, if you're sitting around a hospital and you just like hang out in the cafeteria or something, you'll, you'll notice them. They might not be wearing bright red, but they're either dressed very nicely, they always have a little suitcase, they're always good looking, they're always quite young. Um, it's like where's Waldo a little bit when you're doing this research. You're like, I'm seeing them. I'm seeing them everywhere. So I think the issue, the, perhaps we could think of these as unintended consequences of a policy. So if, an, if a sales rep has to have an appointment, the only way they can do that is, is to have a relationship with a clinician. So their top priority was to find a clinician champion, someone like Rachel, the wound care specialist, because if they ever needed to be in the hospital, they call Rachel, she gets them an appointment. You come in, you get your badge, you go to your appointment. But after your appointment's done, you still have your badge. 
So sales reps would take that opportunity to then walk all over the hospital, find someone else. Nobody calls them out because they're wearing a badge. They look like they're supposed to be there. And they basically get a free pass. Similarly, with the in-service education, in the purchasing contract, it's formalized. A vendor comes in, does the little training on the glucometer, but then they can leave their card. And so the nurses, whenever they have a question about glucometers, can then call that sales rep, who will come back day or night. Um, you know, the hospital staff are not gonna show up at 2 a.m. if your glucometer breaks. So this can be a really helpful resource and is a foot in the door. So for the administrators, this had been controlled and kind of reined in by these policies, but they weren't seeing how these policies actually open doors for long-term relationships and repeated interactions. And so, of course, once you've got the badge, once you've got the red scrubs, once you're in the door, sales reps, many of them working on commission, one, one supply chain um, manager said they try and grab a clinician and plant the seed. So I talked to some nurses that worked in a case management office, so they're responsible for a lot of discharge planning and referrals, and they actually had a sign on their door that said, no vendors today. And they had had such an influx of pens and mugs and chocolates and drop-ins that like, it, it was interfering with their work. Um, and this was in a hospital that had a policy that required vendors to check in, that required them to have an appointment. Um, so somehow they were still getting through, but it wasn't on the administration radar at all. And I think the samples, and they would leave also brochures or information, things that could kind of stay behind once their badge expired or their appointment was up. Um, and I think this is also where we saw a lot of what I would call upselling. So you know, you, this happens probably with cars or computers, this idea that you, you, know, you have the basic model and then they want to sell you the leather seats and the cool thing that moves and the extra software and the, I don't know what else you can upsell, I would be a terrible salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the hospital would buy this great IV pump and the sales rep would come in and do the training, but then they would say, oh, well, you know, your hospital didn't buy, like, the pro software and your pump could also do these all cool things. And then next thing you know, the nurse manager has all these emails from the staff nurses who say, oh, well, we really want the pro software so our pump can do all these things. And, and these, these were the ways that they could really kind of weave themselves into the fabric of, of the day-to-day -day business of the hospital in ways that were completely unseen. And then the requests for new products and more expensive products appeared to be coming from the clinicians, even though the sales reps were kind of behind the scenes. So nurses, I think, are really well known for their ingenuity. When nurses face like a challenge or a problem, it tends to be something that's really immediate, which is why I love being a researcher. Because people get really stressed out and like there's all like there's no such thing as a research emergency. There just never is. <laughs> but in nursing practice, when you need something, you need it now. And if your pump breaks or your wound care dressing falls apart or you're missing a piece, you have to solve that problem. So nurses devise these crazy workarounds. They, they, they have such crazy like MacGyver-esque solutions where they're taping and tying and cutting and, and all sorts of, yeah, you can talk, if you know any nurses, talk to them about their practical workarounds. And I think for me, symbolically, their relationships with industry were often of a similar, in a similar vein, that the sales rep itself was a workaround. And they were providing personnel, resources, products, samples. They were filling gaps in the system that shouldn't really exist. And I think this is really the crux of the issue, is that the policy on the surface was trying to control marketing, drop-ins, trying to align uh, industry business with hospital business, making sure that interactions were only happening when it served the hospital's interest. 
But what was completely, like, just kind of behind the scenes is the fact that nurses in industry were developing relationships over time and that nurses could call on industry to patch some holes. Um, so just recently, for example, I was, over the holidays, I was back in Alberta. My sister is a nurse at a neonatal unit, and I think in December there is, it's called like National Preemie Day for premature babies. So this is no criticism of Alberta Health Services, but for example, they do not provide funding for patient or family support. The NICU, the intensive care unit where my sister works, they like to have a tea on World Preemie Day um, and invite graduates, so preemies that have been discharged and are now children and their families to come back. You know, these are families that sometimes spend six months, the first six months of their baby's life on an intensive care unit. They get to know these families, they get to know these kids, but then they go off in the world, they don't see them again. This is like something so simple. I think the entire event probably cost less than $400, uh, but, but created so much support for families currently in the hospital, families outside the hospital. It's something that is very characteristic of nursing care. Beyond the medical problem, the type of care that we, we provide to families and communities that doesn't fit necessarily in the health system. But there is a company and they make a vaccine. I think it's Abvi is the company. They make a vaccine for, what is it? It's not enough. Oh. It's, um, it's anyway, it's a respiratory disease. Premature babies are particularly susceptible. This particular vaccine costs $7,000 a pop. And so in most provinces in the country, they have a triage system. And, they, and nurses assess babies give them a score, and the ones with the highest score get the vaccine. If you've got a lower score, you may be out of luck. And so the rep for this company obviously knows the nurses on the neonatal unit quite well, and they cough up the $400 every year for this graduation tea. And so I think this goes back to the food, flattery, and friendship. And I talked to my sister about it, and in fact, she's read my book. She was my clinical editor, <laughs> and I was like, you're a what? And she's like, I didn't want to tell you because I thought you'd be mad. I'm like, no, I'm not mad. <laughs> she's like, it's just like in the book. I'm like, yes, it's just like in the book. <laughs> and of course, there was a big cake. He brought the cake, and he brought his literature, and he was at the event, and, and she said, but I, you know, and he wants to meet me for coffee. Why would he meet you for coffee? And I'm like, don't drink the coffee. <laughs> she, was, she was like, I didn't drink the coffee. I stayed strong. But she's like, but I have to go for coffee because I don't want to piss him off because I need the cake at next year's tea. And so these are the kinds of things that are going on and might seem quite small in comparison. But then when we go down the road and we see that $7,000 vaccine and the problems that we have with, with <coughs> equity, which I would say are probably have a lot more to do with the cost of that drug than our current triage system, it's, it's, it's a much bigger deal. And so I, I kind of talk about this idea, of the more we get together, not only is industry filling gaps, but nurses are the perfect friends for industry. They know the system, they have a huge amount of influence, and nobody's watching what they're doing. And so I think marketing, presents as a partnership, it no longer has that icky, slimy marketing feeling. And the relationships that form then give these reps unprecedented access to decision makers. So you think about this preemie graduation tea. So we've got patients, we've got families, we've got the nurses, we've got the neonatologists, we've got the hospital managers, and the rep suddenly has all the decision makers in one room, and it costs that company $350 at Safeway. And so I think we need to start thinking about structural management. This is more than educating nurses about the dangers. My sister probably knows this <coughs> literature better than anyone else, and yet she didn't feel she was in a position to change the relationship that her unit had with this sales rep that's been really long standing. And I totally get that. And I think it also means starting to think about what gaps in the system industry is filling, because no policy or no law or any sort of transparency is not going to kind of fix the root cause of why these relationships are forming. 
So I think we talked a little bit today about how policies might inadvertently make nurses targets for industry and, and, and the consequence really is that they become built in. That some of these formal policies are actually neutralizing the feeling of marketing and making it disappear even further from view. And that these policies are also not entirely effective. That, that sales reps and these marketing interactions are, are still seeping through <coughs> the cracks. And that we probably need to start denormalizing some of these education and support functions and, and naming them different names and realizing that there really is a sales mandate at work. So I'd like to finish with um, these are photos that I took at this, this nursing conference. Um, just back to the food, friendship, and flattery. So 3M, they make a, like the sticky electrodes and a whole host of other things. So it was their birthday, so you could get cake. Moniki is a big wound care company, so I think there's like a mad scientist. You could get like an ice cream sundae at their booth. Um, so things like branded pens and such, they're not really in vogue anymore because, you know, people had some really effective campaigns to denormalize that. So now you get <coughs> consumables, right? There's no, there's no evidence of the cake once you ate it. Uh, a lot of these booths, you get a latte or something. And then this last one, Bard. Um, this was, you could get your photo taken here. So can anyone guess what that mascot is? There's a couple of health professionals here. He is a, a human-sized urinary catheter. <laughs> Bart, Bart makes urinary catheters, so they create this beautiful sculpture. And you can get your, your photo taken with the... So this is marketing to nurses in a nutshell. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much to Trudeau. And, and, and Okay, so I'm gonna just turn so I can see all of your faces. Thank you um, all for coming and supporting um, this really great seminar series that I've been to as a, that I was actually in attendance at as a student. Um, so now it's really exciting for me to be back. It's sort of full circle here with Trudeau. Um, I'll start with uh, but by saying Quinn and I first met each other as part of the pharmaceutical policy research collaboration. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Quinn and I uh, first met back in 2012 um, as part of the Pharmaceutical Policy Research Collaboration when we were both research fellows. Um, and that was, as you can see, quite an effective program because here we are together um, today and uh, both um, publishing and, and researching um, both on the issue of conflicts of interest, pharmaceutical marketing, um, and, and industry influence in medical practice, clinical practice, um, but in two different areas. Right? Quinn is really on the leading edge of the nursing side of things, uh, which is newer than the research on the doctor side of things. So I think that that's a really important thing to note, that um, Quinn's work is really on this leading edge of conflict of interest relationships with nurses. Um, the conflict of interest world, just to give everyone here a little bit of background about the, the um, ethos that this research is happening in, the conflict of interest world is actually quite small. Um, the researchers who do this research on pharmaceutical and medical device conflict of interest relationships um, in the uh, medical or clinical field is actually quite small. We're all over the world, but um, quite small, and we all work quite closely together. And so within that um, field, within this field, there are some subcategories, nursing is one of them, um, uh, conflict of interest relationships with doctors is another, and then my research, which I'm going to bring in in response to a couple of um, the, uh, the um, some, some findings in the article, uh, mine is in um, uh, uh, conflict of interest relationships with doctors, but also uh, pharmaceutical fraud, so when does data get hidden, when and what side effects data gets hidden, and then who's harmed by that? What are the outcomes? And then, of course, Trudeau mentioned that I'm almost done my law degree up at Osgood. I don't know that any, there are any other Osgood uh, people here. But um, I, uh, and so my research now um, marries the two, uh, the two issues, conflict of interest and, uh, and law. So, um, so far for me, that's been in the area of, of fraudulent concealment, fraudulent misrepresentation, um, which also affects nurses. 
because if side effects are hidden, they're also hidden from nurses. And nurses, as people who are on the forefront, are the primary, in many cases, caregivers um, and carers on the units um, and in people's homes, um, if, if, the, if these important people don't have side effects data, then this is obviously problematic and can cause a lot of um, injury that, that goes without, um, uh, without cause. No one, no one uh, can, can identify the cause without the data. So the study is extremely valuable. Um, it's really important that we ask questions about money. If ever you're in doubt, follow the money, right? Where is the money? How is it being spent? What is it being spent on? And what is the outcome and effect of how that money is being spent? Um, so I'll just um, move through. I just made a couple of comments uh, through the paper. Um, in addition to, uh, to conflict of interest relationships with nurses, I'll just mention quickly that pharmacists are also an area that's under research. Um, so pens may be out of vogue, but if you go into your pharmacist, you'll see the Rambaxi pen and the, all the generic pens, right? So we also have to remember that the brand industry is competing against the generic industry, and then the generic industry competes within itself. Um, so that's an important thing to note. Um, as I said, nurses are often the first line of communication for our patients as well as their families. And as I said, follow the money, and industry never spends money if they don't get a worthwhile investment. So, if you ever want to know what kind of marketing works, just look to where the money is being spent. Because industry will never, ever spend money in a way that doesn't work. Okay? Um, nurses as gatekeepers are, is a hugely important concept. Because we have to understand that doctors, you know, nurses are extremely busy. Doctors are also busy. I think many uh, nurses would say, and, and from the interactions I've had with nurses, would in many cases agree that doctors, uh, nurses are more busy in many cases um, than doctors because the nurses are the people that get called first. And the nurses, you know, if you ever have had a family member in the hospital or if you've been in the hospital, it's the nurse that you see on the floor and you have to request that appointment with the doctor. When is that doctor coming in? When is the appointment? And the nurse will, in many cases, be able to answer your question, but they also pass messages from the family along to the doctor. And so there's this concept that some of you may be um, familiar with, direct-to-consumer advertising, which is essentially marketing to the patient, to the consumers out in the public, even before they become patients. And when families request certain treatments, those nurses may, might take those requests back to the doctor, but also the nurse might have some communication with the family. Oh, well, have you heard of this? I just learned about this new thing. So nurses truly are on the front lines, and they are the gatekeepers to the doctors where the majority of the research sits in this field. Um, there's also this notion that disclosure, which, which Quinn mentioned, is um, a cleansing. So what happens in many cases is, uh, and even at the medical school here and at any medical school uh, in the country, any time an industry rep um, comes to give a talk or a doctor who's fund, funded by a drug company comes to give a talk, they'll have a slide up that's a disclosure slide, right? Just like Quinn had her slide on who funded her study, speakers will come in and their first slide or their second slide after their name will be, you know, I am here being fun, you know, this talk is funded by whatever company. I don't mention company names when I give talks. <laughs> so by whatever company. And then there's an assumption in the audience that, okay, well then everything that they're saying must be true. And that's actually not the case. Anything that is funded by um, a drug company is effectively marketing information. We can call it education, but it's marketing information because it's been sanitized. We don't get the full story. We don't have the primary data because we don't own the, the public doesn't own the primary data. The individual company owns the primary data. So disclosure doesn't cleanse. It's sort of this facade of, um, of, of 
neutrality, which, which we can't assume exists. Um, the paper also brought up this really interesting point about nurses as a fiduciary to patients. So I just wanted to take a moment and read from uh, a paper that I wrote on fraudulent misrepresentation that's due to be out um, in a book um, about how fiduciary duty is defined in law, considering that here we are in the law school. So um, just very quickly, the fiduciary relationships in the context of medicine, because it's different um, or has a similar but different definition in business, includes the duty of the physician to act with utmost good faith and loyalty, to hold patients' information in confidence, to make proper disclosure of information to patients, which can't happen if the doctors and therefore nurses don't have the information, the obligation to grant access to the information used in administering treatment, to grant access uh, to the patient's records within limits to be decided by the physician in the best interest of the patient, the fiduciary has scope for the exercise of some discretion or power. The fiduciary can unilaterally exercise that power or discretion so as to affect the beneficiary's legal or practical interests. The beneficiary is peculiar, uh, peculiarly vulnerable or at the mercy of the fiduciary holding the discretion or power. So I think that this is a really important concept to raise. Um, and just in some very cursory research that I did before coming here, the law doesn't actually define fiduciary when it comes to nurses in Canada, which is really interesting. So I think that that's also something to, to look at because most of the fiduciary relationships um, that are discussed are about doctors. Um, so I'll just, uh, I have lots of other comments, but I think in the interest of time, and I can jump back in if necessary a little bit later, I'll close with an anecdote um, about uh, drug reps and they, their development of relationships with clinicians. So I was in a Starbucks writing my dissertation. That's where I wrote most of my <laughs> dissertation <laughs> um, some years ago. And um, I was sitting, you know, on the bars, you know, by the window. And these two people in suits sat beside me. And of course, I have like all my books about pharmaceutical policy and fraud like everywhere. <laughs> And these two people sit beside me, and they didn't care about what I was doing. They opened up their laptop, and I just, you know, looked over, and it was a spreadsheet of doctors' names and everything about those doctors. Their receptionists, how many kids each person in the office had, what kind of coffee they liked, if they liked golf, if they didn't like golf, if they liked sports, if they liked the theater, what their kids did, if their kids played soccer or anything, um, anything else about the family, whether they were divorced, whether they had a new family, everything. And these, drug, these were drug reps who had been assigned to a particular region within the GTA, and these were the doctors uh, that they were uh, going to market to. So this idea of these relationships happening within um, clinical practice, is they're, they're calculated and in fact um, purposeful relationships, and uh, they shouldn't be um, uh, interpreted as in any way naive, they're purposeful, and um, and they do have the, the potential to cause um, harm in terms of safety, cost effectiveness, and efficacy of drugs um, and devices. So that's where I'll finish. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Great. So we'll open it up for a question. So if you um, want to ask a question and you're not one of the students on my list, Feel free to uh, put up your hand. So I'll start with um, <clears throat> with Mina. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about uh, what's the best way to address the conflict of interest. I can't. Can you speak up? Please? Sure. Um, yeah, my question pertains to what's the best way to address any conflict of interest. You talked about sunshine laws, which is legislation and regulation, and then there's internal hospital policy, which may or may not be effective according to your presentation. So. Um, do you think legislation and regulation is the answer? Should that um, focus on nurses or on sales reps and what power sales reps have? Yeah, so I think there's actually a number of options. So I am often critical of disclosure as a standalone, but just to be clear, I think that Sunshine laws and regulation and disclosure is absolutely necessary. And I think the reason for that is that we, we can't understand the full scope of these interactions or relationships 
or study their impact until we have a clear picture of what's going on. I'm critical of the fact that often that's where our laws or policies stop, as if disclosure itself will solve the problem. I think at the hospital level, the crux of the issue is that the health system still wants to benefit from industry's resources while having kind of a risk management approach. And I think what we need to do is think about the fact that the costs, so although industry, for example, provides a lot of education or product support for free, we often end up paying for it later through the use of more expensive products, through the samples, through side effects, um, and, and the fact that a lot of the information is biased, and so people then end up re-educating themselves. So I, I think although hospitals have brought in policy on the surface, I would suggest that Although, you know, nurses and doctors, we're not going to go out and start manufacturing our own wound care products anytime soon. There's going to be some degree of interaction. Um, but I do think that it's going to be very difficult to have this win-win. And so we might need to, to take out a lot of these freebies and, and think about tightening, tightening that up. Mm -hmm. I have uh, Annette. Mm -hmm. This may have been answered, but my question was, do you think the fact that nurses tend to show this tendency of discounting their influence and saying, well, I don't actually have a say, is likely to sort of lead to sort of a subconscious effect on the way they think it <coughs> because they think that it doesn't matter? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. When you, when you talk to doctors about this, they've done tons of surveys. Doctors think, okay, I'm generalizing, don't offend anyone, but they generally feel like they're smart enough to see through the marketing. So when you survey doctors, they'll say, oh yeah, my colleagues totally will fall for that. It will influence them, but not me. I like to see drug reps from multiple country, companies so that I get a balanced view, or I'll invite them in to disparage each other's products, or you know, I just, I just approach it with a grain of salt. And nurses didn't really say that, which was surprising, but instead they, they had this thing, well, well, it doesn't really matter because I don't prescribe. Like, you know, we go to these drug dinners, it's like a nice girl's night out. It's a restaurant I could normally afford. Um, and so I, I think it's equally dangerous, as you suggest, because it's not being particularly reflexive of the, about the effects of marketing. And it doesn't, um, it kind of allows you not to take responsibility for, for the power that you do have. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for it, and nursing, um, Still, it's, it's a highly gendered profession. Historically, and continuing to this day, there is an intense hierarchy within, within the health system. And I think there's a lot of reasons why nurses' power and influence are not recognized and, and how they've internalized that. But I don't think it's acceptable either. And I think we probably need to start working against that assumption. Because industry gets it. Industry sees that nurses are influential. If I may, uh, may uh, jump in here, um, you, you would generally talk more about the kind of the subtle influences, huh? but I um, started writing uh, probably more than 10 years ago actually on the issue of finder's fees. After I was contacted by a physician who was working as a geriatric researcher uh, on um, non-pharmaceutical forms of treatment. And so he was not funded by industry because industry doesn't have any interest in in more psychological yeah. support programs. And he asked me, he said, you know, I would be interested if, if you could write a paper or if, if somebody could do research on, on the use of finder's fees. And his example was that he had difficulties recruiting patients into clinical trials because his own research nurse would be approached yeah. by the research nurse of a physician working with industry funding. And she would say to her colleague research nurse, if you can ship some of your patients to me, yeah. um, the summer is coming up, and we can give you, we can yeah. get you some very nice furniture. Yeah, I would say that's 
nearly blatant corruption, yeah. but um, but I, 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 have you encountered these kind of examples? Oh yeah, and I'm just going to advertise, if anyone wants to do a PhD, this would be such a good project. So, in, in, so the world of clinical trials, I think what, something upwards of 80% are sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. These are the trials they use to bring their drugs to market and also to market their drugs post-market. Um, and people think about doctors and these, you know, they, they often get paid per person that they recruit to the trial, lots of other perks. Nobody anywhere has done any thinking or writing about the fact that the pharmaceutical industry employs a huge number of nurses as clinical trials coordinators. So while the doctor might be the PI on the study, it's the nurse who is physically in the room that recruits the patient, collects the data, communicates with families. And so in some ways, uh, people have you know, criticized doctors for having a conflict of interest by you know, being paid per participant. But these nurses, their entire job is dependent on making sure that trial is successful for pharma. And actually, one of my colleagues shared that in, mm -hmm. I think in a previous life, he was a, a research nurse for a trial, and the company's I think he was talking about a trip to Prague and the whining and the dining and their entire, you know, the fact that whether they have a job or not will be dependent on, on the success of that, that trial. And I think it's probably really complex and needs some serious qualitative or something, some type of research because it's really not on the radar. Mm -hmm. um, I have Hartley. Yeah, I guess this kind of builds on the previous question, but I was wondering if you think we'll see a trend towards more empowerment of nurses, or if there needs to be some kind of a transformative shift in how the medical establishment thinks about nursing roles before that happens. I think we're seeing it, and, and in parallel, we're seeing increased marketing to nurses. So I think Ontario just brought in some increased scope of practice for nurses. So things like RN prescribing of certain vaccines, for example. Um, I think you know we're facing epidemics more of chronic disease as a society, and that's where you see much more nursing care and in the community and people who are taking drugs for their entire lives, things like medication adherence, multidisciplinary teams, like th this is what's happening in healthcare. And so we're seeing the scope and the influence of the nurse, I think, growing and also increasingly recognized. But I think the flip side of that is that they're also becoming more and more a target for these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I have Anita. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I was reading your paper, I was wondering whether or not your research methodology could be used as a tool for healthcare facilities to identify and then solve for problems of conflict of interest. Because in particular, you mentioned that different healthcare facilities may have one set of problems and another one may have another set of problems or it just might not be as prevalent in another setting. And that could be translated into yes. structural and policy changes. That's really interesting. So you mean kind of like the use of people's stories to share that? Well, exactly, because it, it, you have to weed out the problem first. Yeah. And yeah. so the way you've done that might be a useful tool for healthcare facilities yeah. to see whether or not they have a problem, despite their feeling that yeah. they might not. Yeah, and I think that's what I really like about qualitative research is that in a sense it's also an intervention so in a lot of these interviews people said to me you know I've been dealing with this my entire career but this is the first time I've ever talked about it and so I think just the act of doing an interview like you say you're you're helping create a conversation um, I also think in ethics type education in general in our curriculum we often are, are taught principles or values, but for, for regular people, often stories are a much more compelling way to, to enter a conversation. And I think, yeah, that, I would be interested in your ideas on that. Because I think, yeah, I think people, 
they can find it a less confronting way sometimes too to, to enter a controversial topic mm -hmm. if they can see themselves in someone else's story. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, jump in at any point, let me know. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, so so um, I'll go to Greg first, and then I'll take some two questions from the audience. Great. Uh, so, so I'm kind of curious to know more about uh, what you think about the causes and perpetuating factors behind the passive account that were really illuminating in that regard. I noticed that you had uh, you had listed sexism, the undervaluing of caring professions, and the historic subordination of the nursing profession. And medical profession and hospitals as, as factors contributing to the discourses of how, how nurses see their own power, how society sees their ability to exercise power. Uh, just given some of the, uh, the social developments and uh, trends in the healthcare industry that we're talking about now, and just positive changes uh, in those factors, what do you see to be the most pressing uh, or most influential factors at this point in time? I think one of the key contemporary issues is around billing and reimbursement. So we live in a health system that's a fee-for-service model, largely for physicians, which I think has its own problems, so this is not saying fee-for-service is good, but typically um, the hospital, everything a nurse does is lumped under the charge room and board. So if you have a hospital stay and it goes to OHIP, um, all, all of the care that a nurse provides is kind of under a lump sum, either the OR fees or, or an inpatient stay. And I think the, the consequence of that is that a lot of the decisions that nurses make in their practice go completely unrecognized, unnamed, and also uncounted. And so the nursing profession, for example, they are constantly at battle to increase the ratio of nurses to patients. We have really good data that that decreases mortality and morbidity. But obviously, nurses, well not obviously, it doesn't have to be this way. I think because nurses are, there's so many of us, the health system often sees nurses as a cost. So their wages are quite high, they're unionized, and there's a lot of them. And so nurses, I think, are, are often really having difficulty communicating their influence or tracing their decisions or even quantifying or accounting for the things that they do because of the way that their work and their labor is, is built. I don't think moving nurses to a fee-for-service model is a good solution to that, but um, I think that's one reason. Like We have, we have really good data, and, and it's part of the reason why we can link you know, there's been some great analyses recently where they, they looked at all the physicians in this database that received meals, and then they can match it against prescriptions written. So you can actually quantify that and associate marketing with a, a decision. In nursing, we don't have that kind of equivalent, and so it's a less kind of less apparent these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Can you? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sure. All right. Um, thank you very much and for the response as well. Um, I, I didn't get access to the paper, so I apologize if this is in the paper and it's already been covered. Um, question I have is, in, in your data, did you find any pockets of resistance amongst some of the nurses? So ones who weren't sort of discussing about the nature of relationships, kind of thing you presented on, but more <clears throat> were about actually, you know, like this is, we shouldn't be doing this, or you know, sunshine laws and policies are, you know, aren't worthwhile. We should have complete divestment. This hospital, you know, all of these. Like, did you find anything like that? Yeah, I did, and that's all, that's probably another talk. Um, I'd be remiss. I so part of this talk is celebrating a book that just came out that I've written, and there's a whole chapter in the book. There was a handful of nurses, so there weren't that many, who I would characterize as the resistance. But what was so interesting is that this resistance was com a completely individual thing. No one had ever really taught them to be resistant. It's something they, a lot of them are quite experienced nurses, so it was getting burned again and again in their practice, that they, they developed their own set of strategies to deal with it. But they were, they were so different, and one of them, I kind of characterize her as like policing. 
So she was known by not very nice names among her colleagues. She worked in the operating room. She would throw the cookies in the bin. If the sales rep was not wearing their badge, she'd like kick him out. If he brought a coffee in, she'd throw that in the bin. Like if her colleagues like ate the cake at the conference, she'd shame them. <laughs> so that was one style. Another guy, like I think he used to be an accountant or something, and then he was a nurse manager, and so he had like the business game going on. So he was like always like bargaining and negotiating and like I'm not going to tell them how many bladder scanners I really need because I want to know what kind of price they'll give me when I buy in bulk and like and then another one um, he was like just paranoid he's like I cannot trust anything they say but I don't know what to do and I like he was always doing literature searches himself and so I thought that was really interesting that there's like many forms of resistance but the danger of that is as Adrian pointed out, they take notes on people and they work in all the same hospitals. So once he gets to know the police style one, he, he's going to just follow the rules. And then when he meets the businessman guy, he's just going to put it all on the table. And then when he meets the paranoid <coughs> guy, he's just going to cite more studies. Um, and they can really adapt their sales strategies around that because they all had reps that they like to work with too that kind of fit their, their working style. So I, th I think it's important to kind of look at that and, and like you suggested, you know, share those stories and think about those ways, but I think it has to be more than at that individual level. There are several different mechanisms that you identified by which vendors exercise influence. And I think, as Adrian suggested, they're probably indifferent. Whatever makes them money is what they will do. Um, one of the hardest, I think, to try to figure out how to manage is the fact that the people who have the most information about a product often are the interested parties. If a nurse needs to know how to use, how to do something new on Epic or how to use some yeah. new wound care product, it's not clear who they would turn to for good disinterested information. Do you have any suggestions for how we get around this problem that all of our expertise seems to be conflicted? One product yeah. specifically. Yes, I do. So I think um, it's an even bigger challenge, as you suggest, in nursing practice, because a lot of the products we use don't even need regulatory approval before they come to market. So A, there's probably not going to be any, some of them maybe never even had a study, let alone an independent study. So there's no going to the literature on wound care products, because the manufacturers sponsored all those trials or conduct them. I think there is likely situations where you would turn to the manufacturer for some sort of expertise. And when you talk about surgery or cath lab, we're talking about some really high tech stuff. Um, and, and the narrative, when you talk to surgeons in particular, cardiologists, they say, you know, I can't do this surgery safely without the device wrap present. That might be the case, and we certainly don't want to advocate for like unsafe surgery, but then there are hospitals, for example, I know Kaiser in the States is a model where when it came to their hip implants, so this is an example of a, a surgery where a sales rep will be there every time. The hospitals I was doing the research at, the nurses were ortho specialists, so they only did hips and knees and spines, so these were like highly trained individuals. But every surgeon they worked with preferred a different company. And that meant a completely different set of tools in completely different packaging with a completely different implant. Working at an academic teaching hospital, these nurses then might deal with 20 different sets to do the same procedure in a week. And so they needed the device rep there to help them sort through the box and get the right thing ready and to know what that surgeon wanted, um, which seems like a good thing. Other hospitals have taken the approach, we don't need 20 choices, right? So often surgeons' best reason for choosing their set is it's because of what they trained on. And so it's good to be familiar. You want someone to know how to use their tools. But the reason they trained on that was often because they met the device rep early in their career. So I think some hospitals have independently gone out, done their homework, 
looked at the research and said, you know what, we need three hips. Hip A, hip B, hip C. We're gonna learn these hips inside and out. We're gonna put the money into training our staff. We're gonna have a resident hip or ortho nurse expert in-house. We don't need the reps here. And what they found was in the long run, their costs have come down, their revisions have come down, their side effects from the procedures have come down because they had the expertise to do the project or the, the, the procedures safely. Um, and so I think that's an example where, and hospitals really hate, they call them pre physician preference items. They cost them so much money. And physicians, because they're not employees, have a lot of clout. They'll say, I'll take my business elsewhere. But this seems to be where it gets really tricky, because the nurses are dealing with stuff they've never seen. Mm -hmm. The uh, processes of marketing and sales you outlined are in place in many other industries to Campbell soups and reps around food services to do exactly what you're talking about and they provide free samples snap on tool and die go to uh, mechanics all over to try and sell their wares and so on and on go so this isn't unique it is a common industry practice so you are challenging a common industry practice, which has been in place for a long, long time. Uh, what I haven't heard yet, though, is what I think are true solutions that would um, make for win-wins. I've heard you pretty negative on vendors. That sort of says there's a bias. But they are providing a lot of support. So, where are the positives and where are the negatives and how do you figure those out? So far to me you've only identified really, you've said some of the, the positives but you really focused on the negatives. So what's the next step to make this really usable as opposed to just research? Yeah, so I think, like as I say, nurses and doctors, we're not going out to start manufacturing our own equipment or products anytime soon. And I think that's industry's strength. Um, I think what's missing and what we've lost is this sense of independence that the health system clinicians, they do what they do really well, industry does what they do well. We've blurred the boundaries. So I think even industry, for example, they used to have a lot more personnel in dedicated education roles. But that turned out not to be particularly profitable and, and those were cut. So they had like a firewall between people doing training and people doing sales. And I think probably for many reasons that's now merged into the same. And so I think um, a good model, the people in the basement supply chain, they get conflict of interest and, and people in the purchasing some of what happened in the clinical spaces was shocking to them. And yet they interact with vendors on a daily basis as well. But they understand that they don't need that sales rep to buy their lunch, right? They, you know, they need that person to give them accurate information about a product. They have calls that go out. They have the proposals that come in. They have ways to evaluate them and ways to check each other in, in terms of their judgment. Um, and yet the vendors are, are down there. They have long-standing relationships with them. They get the information they need. It's so when the vendors go upstairs and have cookies and coffees and drug dinners and payments on the side that it really undermines some of their, their processes. And so I, I think there are models and there are cultures in place um, in, say, the supply chain, for example, that the cl clinical side could really adopt and I think um, make things a lot more cost effective and probably safer as well. Are you going to take Would you add something to that? Yeah, I'm happy to add to that. Um, my first response would be that yes, these marketing um, behaviors and initiatives are prevalent and not new in any way. They've evolved, but essentially at their foundations, they're not new. Um, but I think that there's a fundamental difference between um, a faulty car, faulty car part, and a faulty 
drug or medical device. Um, I think that there's something foundationally different about you know, a trunk where, you know, the latch breaks and it falls and that's, you know, a product liability case, potentially, um, as opposed to a drug where there's actually been data that's hidden and the hidden data has come out in discovery in mostly American lawsuits. Um, and so this, so when you take a drug or, um, I'll speak specifically about drugs because they're more regulated than medical devices. Um, when you take a drug, Many people in the, the majority of the population takes medications for chronic, uh, chronic illness, chronic conditions, and they, they're reliant on these medications for sometimes 20, 30, or more years. And so, that the side effect that may be hidden doesn't happen right away. It can happen after you've stopped taking the drug, and it can happen, you know, two or three weeks after you've started. Um, so I think that there's something fundamentally different about marketing soup and marketing drugs and medical devices and so it's not that and, and I'll just respond I don't think that there's a bias because I've also done a lot of work on bias and judgment and thinking um, the theory of judgment theories of bias um, and bias indicates that um, that you'll be faced with a problem and automatically your solution will be a certain result um, based on the bias that you bring to the table. Um, but judgment factors in, and thinking factors in, and certainly critical thinking factors in, especially when you're so heavy into to the research um, on these topics. And um, I, I would say that the perspectives and the, the uh, certainly all every single comment I made is supported by um, evidence. Um, and so, I think that intellectual curiosity in a certain vein is, is quite different than a bias. Um, and I would just um, say that there are, uh, there are certainly solutions. Um, my, you know, my work is a little bit different than, than Quinn's, and so mine is in the area of policy and law. Um, hers is certainly in policy as well. Um, but I... I really think that um, our regulatory bodies are severely underfunded um, and overworked. Um, Health Canada, for example, uh, only investigates a small minority of the trials that they know are going on. Uh, and then there are also there's also the issues of trials going on, you know, elsewhere in other jurisdictions around the world. Um, certainly on vulnerable populations by these things called uh, contract research organizations um, that, that are hired by drug companies in order to conduct their research. So I think that this is certainly a problem that we have to deal with in the locale, but also I think that um, there is certainly room for regulatory response. Um, and I believe uh, in some ways um, lawsuits are helpful um, in that regard in order to bring attention to these issues. The problem is then the harm's already been done um, and a lot, the majority of cases settle before they go to trial so we don't see the outcomes a lot of the time. Um, so I think that any sort of solution is uh, multifaceted and certainly interdisciplinary and um, occurs at you know, several different levels. Um, I have, um, uh, I'll read the names of the, of the students who I still have on the list and you can indicate if you think your answer has been, your question has been answered. So I have Nargis, I, uh, I have Karen Chen, Amelia Fung, and Nara Galustian. So in that order. Huh? I'm okay, I can speak on my own time. Okay. Sure. So Karen. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, I think this has been slightly touched on by both of you, but um, what is I mean, the proper role for a hospital. I'm thinking, I guess, a little bit about vicarious liability. It wouldn't it ultimately be their responsibility to kind of do a better job. <laughs> I guess they don't think that there's a problem. So I think that's the main thing. But I was just wondering, like, why focus your attention on, um, I guess, the ethical standards within the profession rather than um, the, the hospital? So I do think hospitals have a big responsibility here and kind of back to your question I think that's probably the level of policy at the moment that would be most effective 
Except that I also think the hospitals should probably get together and try and harmonize some of their standards because the same reps work at all the hospitals. Um, I think, unfortunately, at the moment, it's a little bit win-win for the hospital in the short term. So they're, they're contracting in service education, they're getting samples, you know, this sort of thing. But the costs show up for the down the road. So the Kaiser model is a really good example is that once they actually drilled into it, the short term gains from having the reps in theater and providing that education, um, they actually made it up when they reduced the number of implants and trained them. Like, so it was cost up front to train their house staff, but then they realized. So I think um, I can't speak to the legal liability, but I, I do think that hospitals are approaching it from a risk management perspective with liability in mind, and that's kind of the, the source of a lot of this vendor credentialing and wearing the badge and having an appointment. Um, I'm not sure that might protect them legally, but I'm not sure that it really addresses the problems and that in the end it's it's kind of patients and then taxpayers and, and insurance and such in the states that are, are paying the price for those relationships. Amelia? Um, I just had a question if you think there are any differences that exist between the Canadian and American contexts. Yeah, so this is something I'm, I'm eager to kind of explore more. I have a feeling that purchasing happens a little bit more centrally here. So kind of the, the, the locus of the, the influence where the decisions are happening, it was happening very much at the department level or even the hospital level, because in the states there really is no health system. And my suspicion here is within health authorities or even provinces, some of the decisions around you know which wound care supplies and devices and implants are probably happening, I think, more centrally. Um, in other ways, though, when you think about it, it's the same companies, they're all, almost all multinationals, the same um, products. I think you know, there's going to be some differences between regulators, certainly. Like, for example, direct-to-consumer advertising is on the books, not legal here, but historically Health Canada hasn't enforced that particularly well, so we, we are exposed to a lot of that also from you know, American media and such. Um, but I, I think for me that's a really interesting avenue for some future work now that I'm, I've just come from Australia actually, so it'll so be kind of a third country comparison. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how much of this is really an indication of where we're going in privatized health care? I mean, you talked about our borders, you know, a little bit about that. But I'm thinking none of this, none of these costs really are publicly accountable. I mean, we see the hospitals budget come up, we see premiers meeting, wringing their hands over the cost of health care. But there's, there's no real oversight. So my conclusion, I just listening to what you're saying, you know, we might be going to an implant type specialization which is outsourced like hernia corrections and shoulder eyes, but the hospitals won't be doing them. Yeah. No, and I and I think um, I think what was interesting to me about this project because in the states I was at the county hospital, so 100% taxpayer funded, probably 80% patients Medicaid or Medicare. So we're talking like a lot of public dollars through to the hospital that is actually a chain of a for-profit national chain. Um, and on the ground, in the front lines, those interactions were really not any different. So the differences were happening maybe at the level of their purchasing committees and such. But in some ways, when you have publicly funded services, that can, that can be better for the, the sales reps because <laughs> It's kind of ironic. So Australia is an interesting system. They have private hospitals and public hospitals. Well, the private hospitals are actually tougher on this stuff, and the private insurers are tougher on this stuff because they are the ones drilling into the data and seeing that it drives up their costs. Um, 
There also was a big scandal recently around pacemakers and weird rebates, so they have their own weird legal ethical issues. But I, I don't think just because the system is public or publicly paid for that it's exempt from some of these issues. And in some cases, it might be worse because, as you mentioned, the oversight may not, or the, you know, the, the incentives are not there to have that level of oversight. So I'm not advocating that we go to privatized healthcare. I don't think that will solve this problem. But uh, I don't know that it's quite as simple as a public-private divide. Okay, on that note, um, uh, let me first invite you, uh, the next seminar will be March 7, Beverly Jacobs will be uh, speaking about uh, indigenous health, it will probably be in the moot court, it will maybe be a bigger event, uh, Beverly Jacobs is a quite well known indigenous uh, uh, law professor uh, who uh, was very active as an advocate before, uh, she's now at Windsor Law School, she did her doctorate on indigenous health, so March 7, but uh, check out the information because we'll likely be in the moot court. Okay? So, and on that note, please uh, join me in thanking our two presenters.